We need not to forget our sick at this time. Uh, for our members, please check the announcement sheet that was emailed on Friday, and let's keep all these good folks uh, in our prayers uh, this week. Also, phone calls and cards uh, would be appreciated by those members. In regards to our services, our Sunday and Wednesday uh, services at the building are suspended until further notice. Live streaming like this will be available for worship on Sunday mornings at 1025, and then Bible class on Wednesday evenings at 630. Uh, in regard to giving, uh, the Lord's Supper will be this morning, but please send your checks to the office and use the online giving on Breeze for that purpose. All other activities at the church uh, have also been suspended until further notice. This includes the senior monthly meals, uh, the youth activities, those would include devotionals, lads to leaders, KPT, and any other functions. Also, the men's and ladies' events, like men's breakfast and lady days has, at ladies' day has also been suspended until further notice. Food deliveries to senior citizens will continue on Mondays, and those who have volunteered uh, will be contacted uh, and given instructions on that. Also, in regard to our minister uh, team questionnaire, uh, please mail those in as you complete those. You can also email them to Alan's email, and that's alan at wacoc.org. Again, that's alan at wacoc.org. Uh, because of this virus situation, we have extended uh, the time to turn them in until April 12th now. Uh, if you have any questions about the survey or how to fill that out, please contact myself or David Rogers in regards to that. The church office will remain open for the communication purposes only. If you need assistance or have updates, uh, please call during the regular business hours. If the staff does not answer, uh, free, feel free to contact one of the ministers who will be here but we would ask that you not stop by during business hours at this time. Also, due to shortages of communion supplies, uh, we encourage you to purchase pure grape juice and matzo crackers. Uh, there is also a recipe for unleavened bread on the most recent email that the office staff has sent out. Uh, that's about all that I have on announcements at this time. Please let us now begin our worship services. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Hopefully you're having a good morning and hopefully our worship together will be done in spirit and in truth. If you have a songbook, turn to number 83, 83. This will be our first song this morning. And again, I encourage you, it might feel uncomfortable, but go ahead and sing and be with us. Cover up my voice the best you can, okay? But let's make sure we sing together. Number 83. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. He answers prayers, He answers prayers, He answers prayers, He's so good to me. He cares for me, he cares for me, he cares for me, he's so good to me. I love him so, I love him so, I love him so, he's so good to me. Let us pray together. Our dear and kind Heavenly Father, we approach thy great throne this morning as your humble servants. We're thankful, Father, that we can share your word with others. We're thankful we can call you our God. Father, we know how much you love us because you gave your only son for us. Father, we know that in you we live, we move, we have our being. We depend on you for everything. We thank you, Father, for first of all the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for our salvation in Christ. We thank you for the family of God 
and the blessings that we have as being fellow servants in your kingdom. We're thankful, Father, for our homes and for our families, for our wives, for our children, for our grandchildren. We're thankful, Father, that we have the means to communicate, to share the good news today. And we know, Father, as we live in this world that we have problems. We have problems of hurt. We have problems of hunger. And so many things challenging us. But we know, Father, that you watch over us. We pray, Father, that we will be your servants throughout this time, of current time of trial, that we will we'll have patience, that we'll be kind to one another, that we'll serve one another. And Father, please forgive us of our sins. Help us as your people, help us as a nation to look to thee for guidance and look to your word. And Father, we pray for our leaders and the powers that be. We pray for those who are doctors and nurses and on the front lines ministering to people. And Father, we pray for those who are lonely, that through some communication and through reaching out, we can help them in their loneliness by serving them, by taking them food by offering our help. And Father, we pray for those around the world. We pray, Father, for your servants that are teaching your word. We pray for those Christians who today may be out of work, and we pray for those who may face shortage of food. Father, continue to bless us. Let us count our blessings today God, indeed, you are so good to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. To help put our hearts and minds in order for the Lord's Supper, let's turn, if you have a song book, to number 1014, 1014. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sins, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me, I will try to live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. We now come to that portion of our worship service where we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. You know, it's very interesting standing up here, uh, as I've done many times before, but now to look out upon a, an empty auditorium. And it's interesting for me because I, I can kind of picture where you are and, and kind of see in my mind the people that are normally here at this particular time. And it's interesting as, as I kind of visualize you now at home, maybe sitting uh, around your kitchen table watching a computer or, 
or having something in your office or maybe on a laptop or some of you are more tech savvy, maybe have it hooked up to your television set. And again, just the encouragement it is for me at this particular time, thinking of you sharing this moment with me as we recognize our Lord. And even though that's an encouragement, it really helps me even more appreciate and more look forward to the time where we will be all back together in this auditorium. And I'll stand before you again and look out on on a full room. But even more than that, I look forward to the ultimate time when we will be together with our Lord. We won't have to worry about illness. We won't have to worry about the physical things that separate us in terms of space and, and time. But we'll be able to share time together forever with our Lord. And that's why this part of our service is so important because it's where we recognize what was necessary for that hope for us to exist. That because of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have a hope that we will be reunited at some point together forever with our Lord. To help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read a passage to you from the book of Titus, and I want us to reflect on this a little bit. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let's all go to our Father in prayer as we give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, as we take this opportunity to partake of this Lord's Supper, Father, we are mindful now of this bread, which represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we take this bread in in a mindset that is appreciative of this great gift that has been given to us. Father, that we understand the love that was demonstrated to us by the sacrifice and the hope that we have through it. And I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'd ask that you bow with me as we give thanks for this fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, as we continue this prayer at this time, Father, we now recognize this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Jesus. Father, the blood that was necessary for the forgiveness of our sins and the blood on which our hope for eternity is based. Father, I pray at at this difficult time in our lives, Father, that we focus on that hope and we focus on the love that was demonstrated to us through this sacrifice, and to know that whatever happens in our lives, whatever happens in our world, that love is always there, and it's been demonstrated to us through this sacrifice. We offer this prayer again in Jesus' name. Amen.
We now come to that portion of our worship service where we focus on contribution and our offering. And as Steve mentioned at the beginning, uh, there are ways in which you continue, can continue to contribute here to Washington Avenue, and we certainly would encourage you to do so. But we want to take a moment, of course, at this time, as we usually do, not only to think about what we give, but to, again, think about the blessings that we have. And just thinking here, this opportunity to present this worship service to you live stream in terms of the resources that we have available to us that just a few years ago weren't even possible. And again, just shows you how richly blessed we have been as a congregation uh, in terms of what we can do uh, with the resources that we provide to the Lord. So I, I ask at this time, let's go to our Father in prayer and show appreciation. Dear Heavenly Father, as we now contemplate on the blessings that, that we have, Father, so many things that uh, at this particular time in, in our country, in our society that, that we're struggling with, Father, it helps us even focus more on the blessings that we do have and just the abundance that we have here in this country and that we have as, as individuals. Father, I pray as, as always that when we do give, Father, we will do so with hearts that are cheerful and that are grateful. And Father, I pray that you will be with the leadership here at Washington Avenue. Uh, I pray for wisdom and strength for the decisions that are made. And Father, as always, we will look to serve you and bring glory and honor to your name. And I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Just want to remind us that we know what the scripture tells us. There's power in God's word. We know that Jesus says in the world we will have trials and tribulations, but he has overcome the world. There is power in the word of God. I will be reading from Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 20 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 20 through 24. And the Bible says, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. And good morning, church. I know today is a little bit of an unusual circumstance, but I just want to start off by saying how thankful I am that we can be together uh, in this particular way for worship services. I checked earlier and it looked like there was between 160 and 170 streams going on at the moment. And unless you have 100 devices that you're streaming at your home, that's a pretty good attendance uh, that we have at the moment. Um, I do want to remind us that it's okay. Given these circumstances, there is no reason to feel guilt or shame that you can't be at the physical building. Uh, we should be grateful that God's provided for us by giving us this platform online where we can worship together. We're praying together, we're singing together, we're taking communion together, and we're now going to spend time in God's Word. At the same time, I know there's a lot of anxiety and frustration and discouragements that are taking place uh, throughout our country, and maybe in your home as well. What I think we have at this moment is an opportunity to take the energy that we're giving to those anxieties and fears, set them aside if we can, and let's give this time to God, and let's put our focus on Him at this moment, knowing that He's in control, knowing that He's going to take care of us, and knowing that we can always rely on Him, I think that will bring us a certain degree of peace. Again, I'm thankful that you're here, and I hope you've got your Bibles ready. I hope you have prepared for this. I don't know how you're dressed at the moment. I suspect some of you are dressed up, and I suspect some of you are less so, but maybe you've got your Sunday pajamas on, 
and uh, I'll be curious to hear how that is, but please do not send pictures, not interested at all. So if you would, let's get your Bibles open, and we are going to be starting, you might want to go ahead and mark Matthew uh, chapter 14, we'll be there shortly. But what I want us to focus on is being new, new through Jesus, new through Jesus. We have so many opportunities to consider things that are new. Our culture is driven by the idea of newness and how we love and appreciate things that are new. We talk about the new smell of a car. We talk about new relationships with great excitement. When people have a new baby, they flood the internet with pictures of the baby and we're excited about those sort of things. Um, Jesus knows about new, certainly he of all people. Hebrews chapter 1, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1 reminds us that Jesus is the creator. And so from God's perspective, he made the entire universe and was there when it was new. And when Jesus created the universe, he made something truly magnificent. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And he gave us the beautiful things that we have, the wonderful flowers and the trees that we can enjoy. God created sunsets and sunrises to start each new day. God gave us the magnificence of the ocean with tremendous new mysteries that we continue to explore, and even the high peaks throughout the world, which inspire us with awe and reverence for his creation. The God created man, and we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so mankind is something very, very special in creation. Even at that moment when man was created new. And from that moment in the Garden of Eden on the sixth day when God created man until this moment now, there has been a sense of newness that can occur because of Jesus and through Jesus. Now, man has accomplished many tremendous things and some diabolical things. And depending on where you are on the fence, something less serious. Let's look at our phones for a moment. The iPhone. Uh, it's certainly something that has changed the world. The first iPhone was created in 2007. And while it was a clunky device compared to what we have now, it really affected the way that we communicate, the way that we connect, and the way that we interact with the world around us. Uh, and then successive years had new versions of those phones in which they had GPS location, tracking, uh, the speed in which it could uh, connect to the internet was amazing. And we found ourselves existing in a new way uh, with one another and the world around us. When we dive into the components of the iPhone, we find out that it's made up of 75 different elements, which is pretty amazing. Some of those are pretty common. Uh, you would expect silicon, of course, it's circuits, aluminum, of course, to make it, uh, potassium, oxygen, gold, tin, even lithium, which makes the batteries. You would expect that. But then there's these interesting things like iridium uh, and gadolinium and rare earth metals that we don't often talk about. And those are interesting to me because we understand that at some point all those elements existed in a raw format created by God. And then because of circumstance and time, because of what we find in nature, those things were mined and pulled out of the earth. And because of the uh, thoughtfulness of man, because of the context of the time he was living in, they were repurposed and created into this device. If we had these elements and presented them to mankind in 2020 B.C., it probably would have been very confusing if you said one day this will create a little device that will communicate and play games and listen to music and you'll take pictures. In fact, 50 years ago, that might have been really confusing to people. But because those raw elements have existed and God put them there in the mountains and in the earth and in the oceans and such, and we pulled them out, because of the context of the time and technology and communication, we've created this new thing an exciting thing, which could be on one hand a tremendous blessing, it could be inconsequential to you, and it could be a curse, depending on how you use it. And it may be that right now that's what you're using to worship God. How amazing is that? It's a new thing. But how does that compare with human beings? 
human beings are also created by God. And human beings go back to that moment in creation, for sure. One of the things that human beings, if we reduce them down, uh, have in common with the foam was that they are created up of elements. In the Journal of uh, Inorganic Biochemistry, there was an article in June 2019 in which they made the statement that humans are made up of 20 essential elements plus some trace metals. But there's 20 primary essential elements that make up a human being, which is less than an iPhone. But at the same time, you're a human. You are not less than an iPhone. Some person uh, tried to calculate the total value of all the elements combined in a normal of an average human weighing about 175, 176 pounds. And they found that that value equaled about 160 to 180 dollars. The new iPhone, when you take it and put all of its components and the manufacturing together, cost about 490 dollars to make. And sure, that's more expensive than the elements of a human, but we completely understand that a human is far more valuable than a phone. Humans were made very differently and with a greater purpose and of elements that aren't necessarily measured in the way that you do aluminum or silicon, iridium, or lithium. We do have our raw elements. We are, were created in a context by choice, and we were given a purpose. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and on days one, two, three, four, five, and then six, God created man. But in a very special way, a very unique way, unlike any other thing that was created. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible tells us, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God gave special attention when he created man. So you are more than the mountains, the sea, and the elements that make them up. You have other components in you that connects you to God. You have spiritual elements that make you up, found in the qualities of God. God also created you with a moral agency, which means that you have an ability to take and consider the elements that, were, that are within you and make you who you are and decide right behavior, which draws you closer to God, Wrong behavior, as he defines it, which draws you away from God. And you can have accountability for that, responsibility for those choices, which would lead you to that ultimate behavior, which you are capable of, unlike any other thing in creation, and that you may imitate Christ. Man's a little bit different than a phone. Man also has a capacity to have new versions of himself. And that's what I really want us to focus on today. Who are you today? And what new you can you be tomorrow through Jesus? You have that capacity. You were created in a very unique, unique way to make that happen. What will you choose to do? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. From the beginning of time, God has placed that possibility in you. What will you do with it? Now, I understand that that is somewhat abstract. And so to help that become more of a concrete idea, something that we can move with and act in and take action today, let's consider Jesus. And I asked you before, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, and let's see some of the things that Jesus is doing that we may imitate in him and how we can make use of what potential God gave us. So I'm going to open up my physical Bible as we do all this digital stuff, and we are going to be in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, 
we have here only five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them here to me. And that's the point in the story where you know something's going to happen. When Jesus says, bring it to me, pivotal moment. And then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. Is this not an amazing moment where we see Jesus act for the benefit of the people? Where we see Jesus do a new thing for the people? You can imagine if these people had not encountered Jesus prior to this particular day, and we know that some had because he had been out and teaching and preaching and doing miracles, and they chose to follow him when he was trying to pull himself away a little bit. And so they were aware of who he was, but this was, for some, it might have been a very new and direct moment with Jesus. And one of the first things that Jesus did was look out and become aware of the people. And when he saw who they were, what they were, how they were in their lives, the Bible said he had compassion on them. And he healed them. And in Mark chapter 6 and verse 34, another gospel account of the event, it says he taught them. And then he performed this incredible miracle when they had this need for food. With just five loaves and two fishes, he created an abundance an abundance to where the baskets were overflowing, that everyone had what they needed and then more was provided for, which is the way of Jesus, which is the way of our God. How blessed are we? So what we can see then that Jesus is taking care of the people. First, he become very aware of who they are and he knows them. Second, he was full of compassion, connected to them in a way that drove him to action. Third, he took care of their physical needs. Uh, in doing so, he would heal them, perform miracles, and take care of their sickness. And then also providing for the food that they needed and in abundance. But fourth, and most importantly, was the teaching. And the time that Jesus personally gave to the people. And in doing so, he's taking care of their most important needs their spiritual needs. So going from the awareness to the compassion to the physical care to the spiritual care, in this one event, we see a depth of activity in Jesus. Now that's important for us to hold on to and it makes the idea we've talked about before of having raw elements and moral agency and imitating Christ a little more concrete. We can say, okay, I can grab a hold of that. That's something that I can respond to. That's something I can take action with. But to help us go a little bit further with that and make that a little bit more concrete, let's look at someone who was a follower of Jesus, who decided to imitate Jesus and grab a hold of many of these same behaviors and traits that Jesus has. Because if another human can do it, then I have an example that I know I can do as well. You remember Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's look at one of Paul's friends, Barnabas, one of his cohorts, because he did an excellent job of this himself. And let's go to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to see a moment where uh, Barnabas really is imitating Jesus in a particular circumstance, in a particular context, using his moral agency and all those elements that God put in him and gave him the opportunity to fulfill. He's imitating Christ in a most beautiful way and in a relatable way, especially now in our current circumstance with the disease in our midst. Let's begin in verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each 
as everyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So like any human, having those spiritual elements within him, the possibility, the potential of the quality of God, Barnabas finds himself in a particular circumstance. Jesus had gone up into heaven in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 2, the church begins in a resounding way on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, where 3,000 people were baptized and, and people became Christians. And Christianity was viable and it was vibrant and it was exciting, but it wasn't without persecution, at least on a local level. Peter and John had been preaching and teaching and healing, and they had been persecuted by local officials and threatened. But even in the midst of all these things, the church is vibrant, and it has needs. And then there comes this man who must have been a person of some reputation because the apostles had already given him a new name, which meant son of encouragement, which would imply that he had been a person who was edifying and lifting people up and who had been doing the encouraging that the people needed. So we see that Barnabas was very aware of the circumstances around him. He was very aware of the people and the Christians and what was going on. He wasn't disconnected from it, isolating himself in a selfish way and thinking only about his needs. He was aware of what was going on. And because there was a need of the people, certainly of a physical sense and of spiritual sense, and because people needed some care, he had taken the resources that God had given him, land, sold it, which implies the compassion that he had for the other people. He was willing to act on their behalf to glorify God. And in doing so, in laying that money at the apostles' feet, he was helping take care of the physical needs so that people could have food, people could have shelter, people could be taken care of if they were sick, people could be loved by having their physical needs taken care of just as Jesus had done. But Barnabas doesn't stop there. Barnabas is certainly a man who valued very deeply his potential to take care of the spiritual needs of people as well pointing them towards Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, we find that Saul had become converted and became Paul. And as he was a great persecutor of the Christians, there was great hesitation to accept him into the fold. Who was it but Barnabas who said, no, this guy is one of us now. This is a guy who we will accept because he is a Christian. Barnabas was one who recognized that Jesus had the power to wash away sins, that Jesus had the power to renew and create something very new and beautiful and powerful in this Christian Paul who would take great action to go out and share the message, the gospel of Jesus. It was Barnabas who recognized that. In Acts chapter 11, it was Barnabas who went to Antioch and saw the tremendous work that was happening, the preaching and the teaching of Jesus, the spiritual care for the people. And it was Barnabas who went and got Paul and brought him in and said, we can do this work. And it was Barnabas and Paul who took the uh, resources that they had in Antioch to bring relief for the famine. And it was Barnabas and Paul who began those missionary journeys, planning churches, encouraging churches, uh, checking on the elders and lifting and building the spiritual needs of the people. Was he an encourager? Oh, yes, he was certainly in the first century, but today, right now, Barnabas is an encourager to us. Don't we find ourselves in a circumstance, if we are aware, where people have needs? Your neighbor, your church family, your physical family, there are people with anxieties and hurt and discouragement and fear right now. Some are considering, what do I do for work? Some are ill and worried, do I have this disease? There's a need. So I can be an encourager. I can have compassion. I can pull forth.
forth out of these spiritual elements that God gave me, like Barnabas, and move forward. I can care for the physical needs, and I can look to the spiritual needs. Let's talk about how we do that right now, because Barnabas matters today as he imitated Jesus, so you can as well. What about the awareness? I tell you, a beautiful thing that I've seen taking place on social media is the way that people have had awareness of their self and their awareness of others. Now, certainly, if we're going to talk about being new through Jesus, awareness of your relationship with God is critical. Jesus created us so that we could be drawn to him and connected to him. Isn't it a beautiful thing that he is able to wash away our sins when we obey his gospel? Isn't it a beautiful thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when it says we can be reconciled, brought back together with God, have a new relationship, be a new creation with God if we obey, repent, put the sin out of our lives, be a transformed new person, we can have that awareness. Isn't it fantastic that we can have self-awareness when we look at our actions and how we are operating in the current circumstances and say, is my behavior good? Does it reflect God? Am I imitating Jesus? And if I failed, am I confronting that? That's taking advantage of that moral agency and saying, I have some responsibility and I can make some choices and I'm going to do that. What has shocked me and, and just been really thrilling and exciting is the way that I've seen that take place as I'm looking at social media on my phone, which normally is a place where you easily see people tearing down and criticizing and destroying that in the circumstances of where we at at this moment in the history of our country and our people, I'm seeing so much more care given. Thanking people, thanking the medical staff and workers, and they deserve that thanks. Thanking the EMT and the doctors, and they deserve that thanks. Thanking the governors and the president and the people who are trying to get things under control and they need that thanks and they need those prayers. There's an awareness of what's going on, for sure. There's even one person I saw post where instead of criticism, they made a post the previous day and they said, you know what, I'm sorry for that. That might have offended people and I want to take ownership of that. Brother, that's not commonly what we see on the internet. And that's a beautiful thing to see people give that kind of care. I've also noticed an awareness of people that are going through different kinds of suffering. There seems to be an elevated notion that let me celebrate your birthday for you. Let me praise you for some things. Let us be aware of the needs of the people around us. That's a good thing to want and to pursue. So what I'm asking you to do is take the time to be extra aware. Pay attention to your neighbors. Check on the older people that may not have people around them. Take time to consider what's going on. I don't know how to tell you how much I appreciate the text that I've received, and I'm sitting here with the elders and know they've received texts as well, saying they're praying, you're praying for us today, you're praying for things that are going on, and you're looking out and being aware that these things are a little bit more difficult than normal. And that moves you to the next thing, which is the compassion. Have a little extra compassion. You have all manner of spiritual elements in you, certainly love and justice, certainly truth, peace, sacrifice. The possibilities of these are very deep and very strong you have the capacity for forgiveness. You have the capacity for brotherly kindness and love. Extend that a little further than you normally would. Do that in a new way for you, your family, and your neighbors. The interesting thing about compassion is on one hand, we have a very shallow understanding and we say, well, maybe it's the way I feel about a circumstance or a situation or a person. But really, when we see Jesus have compassion with people, He's connecting with the people. It's not just a feeling. He's connecting with the people. In that passage in Matthew 14, when the crowds were coming to him and they were hearing teachings and they wanted the healing and, of course, the food, and they would follow him later for the food again in John chapter 6, and he would point to them their spiritual need that I am the bread of life. We see that Jesus was connecting with the people and trying to connect them to God, but he was acting. He was taking action. So 
when we read stories, when we are aware of the people around us, it's good to feel compassion for people. But real compassion is the way that we connect with those people. We reach out. Maybe it's a kind word. Maybe it's a statement, I'm praying for you. Maybe it's, how can I help you? Maybe it's just being there for people. Our technology gives us an unprecedented level of opportunity to connect with people if we use it for that purpose. So while you may be in your homes right now and unable to get out, maybe you have a computer or a phone or something that allows you to FaceTime or Skype to anybody in the world, maybe you need to give that a little bit of attention. You know that old phrase, have you called your mom today? Well, maybe you should call your mom, or maybe you should call your dad and your grandma and your neighbor and everyone else. Act. Be willing to act in an extra way, in a new way, in the way that Jesus did more than you have before. Consider the physical needs of the people around you. Um, people certainly have some needs in this world. It's easy to see that when there's a newborn, right? But even in today, I've heard people saying, man, I go to the store and I can't buy diapers or I can't get formula or I can't get what I need. I was in Target the other day and it was, it was a sad moment. There wasn't very many people in the store. It was a little quieter. The music was not upbeat that you would hear playing in the songs. Um, I don't know. In some ways, it seemed like the colors were a little duller. And there was some lady and she's like, is there bread? Is there no bread? That's so sad. So when you see extra bread, can you buy it to give to someone? If it's someone that you are able to interact with? If you do have extra supplies, can you not help provide? There's ways to make that happen and ways to do it safely. But consider how you can provide for physical needs in a new way, in a way that's beyond what's common, so that you're really reaching in to those uh, spiritual elements that God made you with to provide for people. And ultimately, as humans, the most important thing is caring for the spiritual needs. There is truly a newness that's found only through Jesus with our spiritual needs. It is every reason to rejoice. Do you remember that account where the Ethiopian eunuch was converted? He was trying to study a scroll. It was the book of Isaiah. And Philip comes up to him and says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone teaches it to me? And then Philip teaches him about Jesus. And in teaching him about Jesus, it leads the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts to ask this question. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized as they were traveling along? The guy must have been tremendously uh, concerned about his relationship with God because he had gone from Ethiopia to Jerusalem just to worship God. That's an immense distance. And yet he comes to this new teaching about this guy, Jesus, and he recognizes that this could be a transformative moment because his relationship with God needs to be made new, needs to be the way that pleases God. And so when he hears the teaching, he says, I need to make a change. And so he says, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip says to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then the Bible tells us that they went down into the water and he was baptized. And because of his faith, because of his repentance, because of his confession, because he obeyed and was baptized in faith, trusting in Jesus, when he came up out of that water, he was a new creature, a new creature with a new life, freed from his sins that had been washed away. And I love what the Bible gives us, this little detail. The Holy Spirit is so good for us, given this little detail that says, he went on his way rejoicing, rejoicing. I love that idea of rejoicing, especially in spite of the darkness that exists in our life, in spite of the anxiety, in spite of the fear. Our new life through Jesus is about rejoicing and trusting in Jesus above the fear, the anxiety, and the things that try to pull us down because it's Jesus who lifts us up. We have a new life through Jesus. If you even go back through those parables in Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin of the prodigal son, they end in rejoicing when that which is lost was found. So when we have the opportunity to imitate Jesus and when we've become a new person, 
the most important thing we can do in giving to others and providing for the needs of others is to fulfill their spiritual needs by taking Jesus to them. You have more time on your hands maybe right now than you've had in a while. Are you taking care of the spiritual needs? Are you spending new time in the Word with new study in the Word? Are you praying in a new way for new things? Are you talking about Jesus and what he's done and can do and the peace that comes with him, the rejoicing that comes with him? Are you opening up in new ways with that? I know we're excited about being able to binge watch shows on Netflix. I know you're excited about spending more time playing games. Maybe you're going to go find the Sword of Duquesne. I don't know what you're going to do with your time, but we would be wise if we use this unusual time we have to fulfill spiritual needs in ourselves and the people around us. This, this is a new life in Jesus, through Jesus, for God. What will you do that is new? I want to challenge you starting today, and maybe you can talk about it with your family, that you consider your awareness for the world around you and the people around you tomorrow. What will you do about that tomorrow? What will you do with your compassion? What plans will you make today to get your compassion at a new level in a way that affects the world around you? What will you do to take care of physical needs of the people around you? And what will you most importantly do for the spiritual needs? That's imitating Jesus. That's using your moral agency. That's using those spiritual elements that God put in all of us as humans since the beginning of our creation to affect the world, have a relationship with him, draw closer to him, and look forward to heaven. It's a message of hope, a new life in Jesus. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want you to know that we care for you, we love you, and we want only the best. We want what God wants for you. He loves you. He cherishes you. If you do have a need, if there is some physical need or spiritual need that we can take care of for you, we can pray for you, do not hesitate. Do not hesitate to reach out to us. As soon as this is over, uh, we will be posting uh, email address, phone numbers in a way that you can communicate with us. We do encourage you to continue to support one another. But by all means, be a new creature, a new creation through Jesus. Thank you so much. a difference in the lives of others and to redeem the time that we have in our own lives of Christ. Do not have any more announcements at this time. Uh, Do remember that this uh, Wednesday we'll have a live stream of our services at 630. Be sure to to, to join in on that. And now so let's go ahead and close our, our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We thank you, Father, for every day that we can wake up, that we can get out of bed, Father, and see the beauty of the sunrise before us. We thank you for all the good things that you give us. Father, we pray for this nation at this time, for everybody that's living through uh, the fear that is at this time, Father. We pray that as Christians, Father, we'll use this as an opportunity not for fear, but an opportunity, Father, to serve each other and to serve others, Father. Be with us, strengthen us, help us to love you and Jesus. Help us to spend time in your word, Father, meditating upon the things that will help us draw closer to you. Be with us this week, Father. Help us to make a difference in the lives of others. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And amen.